Hi everybody and welcome back to Headstrong, the podcast where I sit down with a number of people in the public eye to talk to them about their lives and careers, but most importantly, their vulnerabilities that have made them who they are today. As most listeners will know by now, this second series is exclusively about rugby because of the Rugby World Cup. And this will be the final episode of Headstrong before we finally find out the winners of the Rugby World Cup this year with the final taking place on Saturday, the 2nd of November, between England and New Zealand. And crikey, those semi-finals were really great. Uh, I'm really excited that England made the final and that was such a destructive victory over New Zealand. Bad luck to Wales, but it's great to be the, the, the Northern Hemisphere team representing so it's yeah really looking forward to the game and i hope everyone's going to be able to watch the final on saturday at 9 a.m so this week on headstrong for those of you who remembered last week's episode i sat down with matt banahan before about halfway through we were interrupted by former england number eight ben morgan so after i spoke to matt i sat down with ben to talk to him about his childhood his playing career, uh, his former England career, and his aspirations of still hopefully playing for England, uh, how the boys might be faring out there in Japan at the moment, and of course I talked to him as well about having a business on the side with rugby and how that's kept him sane. So I really hope you enjoy this episode of Headstrong. Um, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me today on Headstrong. No worries. It's really kind of you. As you know... Obviously, the Rugby World Cup is well underway. Uh, we now know the teams going into the quarterfinals. And actually, when this episode comes out, we'll, we'll know the semi-final teams. But have there, have there been any surprises to you? Any, any teams that you've seen and have gone, wow, that's a pretty, pretty impressive performance so far? Uh, well, I think the, the standout performance has been uh, Japan in, the, uh, in their last game against Scotland. Um, it was an incredible match. Um, came out of the blocks and... and really kind of uh, blew Scotland away um, they didn't really know how to react and obviously a few stern words at half time and kind of regrouped but um, by that time it was too late and I think that that for me was the most impressive performance that I've seen and and I think really the the biggest tests that we've seen I think the um, Scotland South Africa game at the start um, I think South Africa have actually um, kind of warmed up since then um, yeah. that was a bit of a, a colder game for them um, obviously New Zealand have just just been ticking things off but I think the way the groups have been is um, there's lots of games where we haven't really had and I mean this with the most respect the biggest tests for the, um, the uh, higher team nations yeah. and uh, I think really that with the Japan-Scotland game that's the, the most that we've had obviously um, they beat Ireland as well um, which was probably the more the shock, um, and then obviously since then they've just been building on their performances, and yeah, totally deserve their position. Um, they've been playing some fantastic rugby, and it's you know it's that sort of fairy tale really. It's it's fantastic. It's heart wrenching to see someone like Scotland go out, but equally to have Japan at their home World Cup making the quarter final is fantastic. Seeing these smaller nations put in such solid performances, do you see the gap between the you know the top tier nations and the smaller nations uh, getting smaller and smaller? Truthfully, no. Um, I still think there's a large separation. Um, but I think for certain teams, they're closing the gap. Um, but I still think there's a stark difference between your sort of tier one nations. Um, yeah, for sure. Which is just generally down to the sort of levels that their players are getting exposed to um, regularly. Uh, and, and then obviously then with the, the coaching that comes in around that for the national teams. Is that why perhaps we might have seen in more recent years some transitions for some Pacific Islanders maybe move into um, looking into residency in, in some you know tier one nations? Uh, look, I think the truth uh, with, with people coming across um, and then becoming a resident of a country generally is down to money um, and it's a financial uh, decision for players to come across and, and earn quite substantial sums uh, to go and play for and represent different clubs and then obviously within doing so they then gain residency for the country which obviously then uh, gains their profile again. 
Whilst unrelated to, oh, I assume, finance, you were, had some residency uh, choices in terms of Wales and uh, England as well. Uh, and you, in fact, you declined selection for the England Saxons to keep your options open. But you're born and bred in England, and much to the delight and relief of some England fans, I imagine, you chose England. What was your decision and thought process behind that at that particular period in your career? Yeah, look, really, I, I was young at the time. Um, it was kind of a pretty big shock to be uh, asked to play for the Saxons at the time. Um, I, my decision uh, to decline it at the time was down to the basis of generally a lot of family uh, were speaking to me about uh, what I should and shouldn't do and it kind of clouds what you're thinking. But ultimately it was just the confidence that were they actually looking at me uh, in, a, in a, a true aspect, if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, so that was that was partly down to that decision making at the time and and then obviously um I I did have an opportunity then um later down the line um I know that Wales were showing some interest at the time but um yeah for me I, I am English and um that was that was the sole uh, decision to play for my country. Did you did you feel a lot of pressure, perhaps, from external factors? Because it's quite that's a massive professional decision at the time. Did you feel it coming in from perhaps family and friends, or absolutely. was it your, your own so Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, particularly when you're younger as well, you're very malleable, um, and and <laughs> impressions are, are made by people around you, and, and decisions like that of that magnitude. I don't think actually, I was maybe 19 and that sort of thing is getting banded around and I've only just come into the professional scene anyway down at the Scarlets mm. so yeah certainly with that that level of decision I was influenced by the people around me um, but thankfully I've got some good people around me and, and everything worked out well who, who was it that you really sought your advice from at that period of time because obviously being 19 you've really got to pick and yeah, choose your... I mean general counsel is just from my family great um, so my family have always been great uh, in and around my rugby uh, career and in, in, in general in, in life you know um, so yeah it's a lot to do with my parents really so 2012 was a massive year for you in terms of professionalism. You were lucky enough to be named in the squad for the Six Nations for England. And then in March, you moved to Gloucester. Starting with England, did it feel like you were living out your boyhood dream at this point? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I played, uh, made my debut against Scotland up in Murrayfield. Um, I think it was the 4th of February. Um, and yeah, it was just incredible. Absolutely incredible. When success comes to you like this how do you manage to keep yourself grounded as or, or do you just see it as another job because obviously as a young boy you see people playing for England and you aspire to reach that kind of level of success but when you achieve it you must think wow I've actually done it now feeling big but yeah, or, do, you know, or do you have to keep yourself grounded well certainly for me uh, going into that Six Nations tournament it was it was a, a whole lot of change anyway with Stuart Lancaster coming in and mm. um, there was a, an overhaul in the squad anyway. Lots of young players coming in, fresh faces. I found it that actually, okay, I made my debut against Scotland, um, first first game. But actually, you don't really get a, a, a chance to truly reflect on that because you're in a tournament and then you're moving on to your next game. So then your focus is solely in and around, right, next game, what are we going to do? And you're very much engrossed in what's happening. I don't really think you get time to really appreciate um, the magnitude of what, what you've done or what's been achieved because you have got another focus. You, you've got to continue to work and, and, and your focus is the next game. And I suppose it's only really afterwards that you kind of sit back and look and think, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but at the time, you just head down, focus, and you're working. Yeah, absolutely. And so all your 31 England caps came under Stuart Lancaster's reign. With the arrival of Eddie Jones, you were somewhat overlooked. Did you see that as just a, a change in, in the setup there? Because obviously you must have thought your game stayed the same. Uh, if not, if anything, you were improving. Do you find that um, decision to be left out difficult at the time? Uh, look, it's, always, it's always tough, but um, I think particularly uh, in, in the Gloucester environment um, it's a, a, another case of we're fortunate in terms of there's always new games to prefer, uh, prepare for things to focus on um, and actually at the end of the World Cup uh, in 2015 my son was born so there's many levels to what, what has happened in my life to um, 
pull away from the sort of distraction or disappointment or something like that because you know what I mean so I think from that side of things I, I was quite fortunate um, because I think it, it is the sort of thing that could leave quite a big hole um, certainly my drive hasn't gone and I have every aspiration to continue playing for England um, if I'm given the chance okay I'm, I haven't had that chance to date but that doesn't mean I'm going to give up but I, I'd say that's a lot to do with my mindset anyway Sometimes I suppose it isn't play, playing sport isn't the be all and end all. Whilst it is your profession, as you say, there yeah, are yeah, different absolutely. aspects coming towards you. Many parts of life, you know, and I, I'd say that's probably the biggest thing that's it's, it's changed me. Um, I've got two young children. Um, I've, I've got several businesses. Um, playing for Gloucester, I've got so many things going on in my life that I don't think you can really sit and dwell. Um, you've just got to certainly my attitude is you just got to get on with things and, and, and keep going yeah definitely so moving ho- moving closer to home now uh, and to Gloucester what was it that made you accept that deal when it came across on the table for Gloucester what was so important well, about look, I was this down team? at the Scarlet yeah. um, I, I was uh, I just re-signed a, a senior contract down at the Scarlet but I'm a local lad to Gloucester yeah. so it was kind of a no-brainer for me it's my local club the one that I've grown up supporting um, sure, I'm massively grateful for the opportunity that Scarlets gave me and, and enjoyed my time down there tremendously. Um, but I couldn't ignore an opportunity to come home. Was it was it important um, when Johan came into the setup? You know that his his approach to rugby really unifies the team. Yeah, look, I think um, Johan's whole mantra is play to inspire, mm. and I think. Um, that's something that everyone's been able to get behind. Um, I've been through several uh, head coaches, several management setups through Gloucester in my time here, and uh, certainly his ability to bring everyone together um, is, is, has been tremendous. And uh, yeah, like I said, everyone's bought into it, and ultimately that's that's the main thing. If you can get a team of people to get behind um, the same values and work together, well, there's a makes you a pretty special thing so last season was obviously fantastic for the whole team here at Gloucester but moving outside of your life in rugby you you have a, a, a wife and a young family which must be obviously hard work but very rewarding as well um, but you're also ahead of the game for many others as well because when you came into the game you were a part-time plumber am I right no, and right. now you own a scaffolding company called number eight scaffolding yeah when you, when you, obviously rugby careers don't last forever. How important is it to actually have that other aspect in your life, thinking about the future? Because you know rugby careers can end dramatically soon, or at the very least, you know, end at thirty five, thirty six. And if you don't get into the coaching program, you've got to have something to to stable your life with. How important is that for you? Yeah, look, I think uh, the coaching side of things isn't for everyone, um, and certainly you've got a squad of forty players here. And um, across the across the board, there's a lot of players that retire. So those sort of positions are very, um, very cutthroat. Um, not many available. Um, I genuinely believe the having a business and running it alongside the rugby has been the best thing I've done for my rugby career because it gives me the ability to be able to switch off from a rugby session and focus on something else. And equally, when I come into the rugby environment, I'm totally focused on the rugby environment. So I think for that side of things, mentally, it's been so healthy for me. Because I think certainly in, in this rugby environment, you get a lot of free time um, and a lot of time to dwell on things. And if you've had a bad game at the weekend or if you've done something wrong in training, you can just sit and kind of fester on that. And actually, it becomes uh, pretty messed up in your head. And I think that's the big thing for me is being able to actually like draw a line, focus on something else and then come back to it and be fresh again and and hungry for it. Hi, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. Just a quick word from our two sponsors. Headstrong is very fortunate to have found two amazing sponsors and supporters for season two of Headstrong, the Rugby World Cup special forming a brilliant partnership between Headstrong, our chosen charity Restart Rugby and themselves. They cover between them all aspects of global insurance and both have strong historical ties to the wider rugby and well-being communities. Ascot Group is a Bermuda domiciled global specialist in insurance and reinsurance. Built on a foundation of underwriting expertise, but with a culture of collaboration, dedication, empowerment and accountability that is the fabric of the company. 
Their integrity is reinforced by a strong track record and dedication to clients, brokers and partners. For more information on Ascot Group, visit www.ascotgroup.com. BMS are an entrepreneurial, agile, specialist insurance and reinsurance broker that prides itself on their reputation for exceptional client service and position as one of the leading global brokers. For more information on BMS, visit www.bmsgroup.com. Now, back to the podcast. Uh, so, uh, we've seen the quarterfinals now. We've talked about Japan. Who do you think is going to take this World Cup? The fairy tale would be amazing if uh, Japan could go and win it in their <laughs> yeah, home nation. But um, unfortunately, I think uh, I think I think they'll fall short. Um, who do I think is going to win this World Cup? I think I think England have certainly got the armory to do it. The only concern I have is, like we spoke earlier, is actually, and particularly not having played this French game, I think actually does us a disservice. I think so. So. Well. My concern there is: Have we had a big enough test, um, ready for uh, going through Australia and or whoever's next after that? You know, so that that's my one concern with that. So I think, in that respect, I think um, I think it'll probably end up being a, a New Zealand South Africa final, um, possibly, possibly an England South Africa final. Fingers firmly crossed. Mm. So I ask these two questions to every one of my guests uh, at the end of the podcast. What piece of advice would you give your younger self or to younger adults looking back? To my younger self, probably start start uh, start thinking about life after rugby earlier. Um, even though I believe I, I started relatively early, um, I think you've got to you've got to start planning early and as early as you can. I think that's really important for everyone. Uh, in, in this environment um, I think it's quite easy to get caught up in the sort of bubble um, and actually I was yeah, I, I say this a bit tongue in cheek I was fortunate enough to have a really bad injury and, and uh, break my leg um, in 2015 and that was kind of the kickstart to really put things in motion um, but I think it's you're in almost that bubble where you feel invincible and you you feel like nothing's going to change but the reality is and particularly now with how the game evolves is you, your career could end in an instant and it's lovely to um, think that you're going to have a really long career but you just don't know so I think just being prepared for that sort of life after earlier um, would be a good piece of advice for my, uh, my younger self and uh, certainly for any other young young aspiring uh, athletes coming through and finally what does the word headstrong mean to you uh, headstrong for me is is probably resilience that's that's how I would uh, yeah f- that's my main characteristic when I think around that word um, yeah resilience because things are tough um, it doesn't matter what environment you're in, uh, what workplace you're in, things are tough. Life isn't easy and things can be really difficult but I think a lot of the time you've just got to be as resilient as, it, as you can. Obviously I'm not saying that uh, you go out and fight, fight everything on your own because certainly it's having the the courage to be able to talk things through and help get past a sticky situation but just believe in yourself that you will get through it and certainly when problems seem really difficult and really big try and break them down and if you can break them down into smaller more achievable pieces but then um, hopefully that hope you get through Ben that's really really important stuff thank you so much for your time Uh, and best of luck uh, with the 2019-20 season thank you very much cheers cheers So that is it for this week's episode of Headstrong. It was a shorter episode with Ben. He had to go hit a massive weight session with the boys at Gloucester Rugby. But I hope you don't mind and I hope you found what he said as really interesting and insightful. It's great that players like Ben are devoting their time to activities outside of rugby and businesses, of course. Just because they know that their rugby career is on and it lasts forever. And it's great to have that outward vision to really start preparing yourself for what is outside of rugby and what else is to come because obviously there is so much more to come 
best of luck to England and South Africa at the Rugby World Cup final. However, I will be rooting for England, as I'm sure 99% of the listeners of this podcast will be. Um, Best of luck to the boys, and let's hope we can bring it home, and I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you so much for listening. Please tell all your family and friends about this. I will be carrying on the podcast, even though the Rugby World Cup will be over on Saturday. There will be still some great guests lined up, hopefully all the way through to Christmas. So thanks so much. And I'm now going to hand over to Damien Hopley, the group CEO of the Rugby Players Association, to tell you a little bit more about my chosen charity, Restart Rugby. My name is Damien Hopley, Group Chief Executive of the Rugby Players Association. Restart is the official charity of the RPA, and the charity provides crucial support to current and former professional rugby players suffering from serious injury, illness, or hardship. Since 2005, Restart has invested over 1.7 million into player welfare and support by funding medical treatment, rehabilitation or disability support, financial support, and emotional support by providing a 24-7 confidential counselling service. And we're the only body in English rugby that invests in mental health support. One in four people in the UK will be affected by mental illness in any year. Rugby players are no exception, and often the pressures and strains that act as a catalyst to mental health issues are magnified for professional athletes. Players often find it difficult to cope with the transition out of rugby, and the reality is that over 60% of players reported mental health issues post-retirement and over 50% of players take two years or longer to be in control of their lives post-rugby. In 2008, the Rugby Players Association and Restart launched a 24-7 telephone helpline and counselling service to provide vital mental health support to those players and families that were facing struggles. 42 current and former players accessed the confidential counselling last year More than 140 players have accessed the counselling service over the past three seasons. Every year, Restart spends up to £60,000 on our confidential counselling service to help support our players. Without support from donors and fundraisers, Restart would simply not be able to continue this vital support for our players. Sadly, these mental health issues can lead to devastating consequences. Suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45 in the UK, and rugby players are not immune. It's great to see the players talking more openly about their mental health struggles within rugby and after they finish playing. Thank you for all your support towards Restart. Without people like yourselves, we could not help players and their families in the way that we do. So thank you all very much.